You know, the uh, 80s had a lot of great music. Don't you agree with that? There's something that's going on uh, in my car right now that my uh, son, who is six, uh, many of you know him, and uh, he loves 80s music. It's, it is the craziest thing. But what he loves is the 80s rock music, yeah. all right, of all things, all right? He loves it. Um, I blame his grandparents uh, for this, uh, absolutely. That is not my discipleship in the home, that is uh, their fault. But uh, one of the things that I've recognized of 80s music though is there is a common theme of the top charts of the 80s. Uh, I'm talking about the top 10, top five, top three, always uh, throughout the 80s had this theme about love. Have you ever recognized that? I mean, there's just a lot of love in the air in the 80s. I mean, you think about your favorite song in the 80s, and I bet you there is something in there about love. Now, not all of it is good love, okay? Not all of it is gospel love, but some of you may be thinking of maybe a song by the title, A Crazy Little Thing Called Love by Queen. Anybody? I believe that Dwight Yoakam did it better, all right, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, some uh, of you may be, f- be thinking about um, Endless Love by Diana Ross and Lionel Richie. Uh, some of you may be uh, thinking about Keep On Loving You. Anyone? Nope. Nobody. But are you a speed wagon? All right, let's go. Okay. The old man over here loves it. All right. I'm just kidding, Tim. <laughs> Uh, maybe some of you are thinking about what's love got to do with it by Tina Turner. All right. But there is one song that keeps coming back over and over. You hear it in movies. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, one of those songs, even 40 years later since it came out in 1984, it is still somewhat popular. And the song is by Foreigner. That is, I want to know what love is. You know, there's something funny about that song because it kind of just, it kind of resonates with us. I want to know what love is. I I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. All right, this is the lyrics. And here's the idea of this song is that everyone has a common denominator about them. Every single person, you may not like 80s music, but there is something common that you and I have, uh, and that is that we all want to know love. Every single one of us. We want to feel love, and we also, by God's design, we want to extend love. We want to give love. This is the idea of the way that God made us. He made us in his image, and the fact is, according to 1 John chapter 4, is that God doesn't just love you but rather God is love himself. Any expression of true love is an expression from the character of God himself. God did not create love. He did not just give love. He is not just loving, but rather he is love. There's a difference. Only God is love. It's something that only songs could sing about or write about. It's only uh, love that you and I most commonly know that is superficial, but the love that God is calling us to is not one that is fleeting and it's not one that is just superficial of the world, but rather it is a greater love that can only be known by and from God himself. This is the greater love that the writer of Hebrews actually gets to in Hebrews chapter 13. If you would remember with me this entire time, the writer of Hebrews has been writing this letter and he's giving this this incredible theological thesis of who Christ is and the fact that he is greater than everything. 
He is greater than Moses. He's greater than the priests of the past. He's greater than the old covenant because now he has ushered in this new covenant because he is the founder of this new covenant. He is greater than everything and he extends himself to those who would trust and surrender to him. And so he gets to the apex of this theological thesis and then he comes off of it and says, because Christ is greater and because I have proved it to you, you, then, and because we have this foundation of, of this theological understanding now, now it is time to live like it. Where there is theological depth, there will be a depth of practice that matches in your life. You cannot just know of Christ and not live like Christ. And this is where he takes us from Hebrews 12 to Hebrews 13. It goes from knowing God to acting like God, of knowing Christ to acting like Christ, taking what you have known or or now have uh, known of God is now creating this ethic of the way that you and I would live. So if you have your copy of God's word, would you stand with me as we read Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 6 together. It says this, starting in verse 1. It says, let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them and the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Let's pray. God, would you help us right now, Father, understand what love is. God, that we would have a better understanding of how we are to express this same love that you have given us. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated again. So you can tell that the way that the writer starts out is that he gives us five aspects, five elements of how we are to walk in this love. The first thing that we come to is what he says in verse one is that he says, let brotherly love continue. The first element that you and I need to understand about true love is that it is a love that is continual. I mean, you think about this, all right? So go from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. It says this, it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And he goes from that to verse one that says, let brotherly love continue. All right, God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. He's saying, listen, the only thing that you need to worry about is the consuming fire of God. The only thing that you need to worry about is your placement with Christ, your position with Christ, and everything else is just irrelevant. Everything else is less than your relationship with God. So he sets our sights on Christ himself. And then he says, because of what Christ has done, the fact that his wrath will not be poured out on you because of the love of Jesus that has been extended to you. Therefore, let brotherly love continue. You see, there was a threat to the church that they writer was writing to, that maybe they would turn away from loving each other. This is why he says let, meaning that there could be a person within the church that would disrupt the love of God within the church. That there could be disruption from within the church. And so he says, make sure that you are doing everything possible to love each other well. Let 
brotherly love, and then he says, continue. As if there could be potential that it will not continue. The oppression, the threats of Rome around them, persecution on the rise against this church. He says, listen, you're going to be somewhat tempted to turn against each other during hard times. But he says, instead, let brotherly love continue. No matter what is happening outside the church, you make sure that you are loving well inside the church because those outside the church are going to understand the love of God by watching what is taking place inside the church. This is why Jesus, when he was preparing for his uh, departure from his disciples, and before his betrayal, before the crucifixion, before the burial, before the ascension, he takes his disciples and he says, listen, I am giving you a new command. This is what John chapter 13 says to us, verses 34 and 35. He says, I'm gonna give you this new command. He says, love one another. He says, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The temptation is that the church would turn inward against one another and not love each other as they should. And he's given us a warning. He's reminding us of the words of Jesus. He's saying, no, everyone outside the church is going to know the love of God based on how you treat each other inside the church. And this is an exhortation, but it is also a warning for us that we must be careful. Jesus says the same thing in John chapter 15. He says in verse 12, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. The writer of Hebrews says, let brotherly love continue. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, he says, be imitators of God. And verse 2 says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. You see, the test of love it is usually um, the highest in disagreement but it is strengthened best in tension. Do we get that? That love is tested most in disagreement, but it is strengthened best in tension. What that means is that you and I have different understandings of how things should be done. You and I have a different perspective of what we should do inside the church. We have a different preference for what should be done inside the church. We have different angles of how we think through things. We think this must be the priority. We think this thing must be the priority. We think that my passion uh, should have uh, precedent over, should take precedence over everything else. Uh, whatever I am most passionate about, that is the most important thing for the church. And, and these things happen all the time, right? And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is don't turn inwardly against each other, but rather love each other continually. Don't let the things inside the church tear you apart. Instead, make sure that you are walking in unity. Make sure you are walking in love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And this is what Paul, this is how Paul describes love. You've probably heard it at a wedding before, but it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and I want you to think about the way that we interact with one another inside the church. He says this, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant. Love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Does this describe your life? Does this describe the way you think about the church? 
Does this describe the way that people would look at your life and say, yes, they love the church well, they love each other well. Would people look from the outside at Green Acres Baptist Church and say, man, that is a church of love. That is a church that is kind and patient. That is a church that is never rude and they're always about others instead of self-seeking. Is that what the, the world looks at Green Acres and says? I think for the most part, yes. But the warning is that we must let love continue. This brotherly affection, this Philadelphia that the the writer is describing here, this, this brotherly love, he's saying, make sure that this is supreme within the church because this is the one thing that Jesus said that you must do. You must love each other well, love the church well, so that the world will understand the love of Christ better. You see, in everything we do as a church, we must be loving to one another. In every ministry that we do, in every expense that we have, in every endeavor that we take, we must love each other well. And this must be at the forefront of our mind always, is how am I loving my brother or sister well? How am I loving the church well? The church that Jesus died for, the church that Jesus bled for, the church that Jesus rose again for, the church that Jesus purchased by his own blood, by the divine plan of God the Father, this church that Jesus said the gates of hell will never prevail against it, that will keep going, that is God's plan to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, love that well. He says, make sure that your support of the church is very loud and your critique of the church is very, very small if at all. Be careful how you talk about God's church. Be careful the way that you express concerns about God's church, the way you talk about God's church on Facebook or on social media, the way that you talk about God's church to your friends. Make sure that you defend the church because this is God's plan to reach the world and we are not called to tear it down. We are called to build it up and you cannot do both. You are either a builder or you are tearing it down and make sure that you are on the good side of this warning. He says, make sure if you want to live out the way that God is calling you, if you want to live out as a soldier for Jesus Christ, then make sure that you are loud about the church because Jesus chose to die for it. So let's be cautious as his church to love each other very, very well. To love each other when we disagree to love each other when we don't like the carpet or we do like the carpet, to love each other when we do things right and when we do things wrong because at the end of the day, you and I are sinners in need of God's grace and his mercy and we must keep pointing each other to the savior of the world and that is how we love one another. Love, in short, is intentionally showing the love of Christ. If you are not showing the love of Christ, then you are not loving. We must show the love of Christ. He says we also must have a love that is considerate. Look at what he says in verse 2. He says, don't neglect to show hospitality. For by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. You know that there are times that you may be kind to someone, you may uh, show uh, hospitality to somebody, and it could be an angel. That is the warning here. Now, he's saying this is not our motivation, it's just a reality, that you don't know who you are serving. You don't always know who you are showing kindness to. The idea here is that we are to show the love of Christ, not just inwardly, but it should flow outwardly from us, even to strangers. That's the idea. The church must continue to be hospitable, even in a world of hostility. The world around us is grinding gears. It's against one another, division, lack of peace, nothing but chaos, but from the church flows the love of Christ. 
And when we have the love of Christ in us, we don't just get tempted to have a hu holy huddle within us and, and we're just loving toward each other, although that, that is our calling to love one another. But if we truly have the love of Christ, we are going to love each other well and then we're going to love others with the same passion and with the same intensity. Those who are different from us, that's a stranger. And it's not just people who look differently from you. It's people who may have a different belief than you. It's people who may have a different political view than you. It could be someone who votes different than you. Oh, no. You're saying I have to love that stranger? Yes. That is the call. Why? Because the love of Christ supersedes anything that this world has. Our job is not to help others align with us politically. Our job is not to help others see my point of view. My job is to point you to the savior of the world and that is Jesus. The most hospitable thing that you can do is to make someone feel the love of Christ because of the way you treat them. You know, Maya Angelou famously said, I've learned that people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. You know, as a church family, it should be our job, it should be our goal that every person who comes through these doors, that we make sure that they feel welcome, that they feel as if they belong. That's true hospitality. It's taking someone who is a stranger that does not belong and saying, no, you do belong, and then you make a way for them to belong with you. Jesus's ministry was full of this. Jesus was always in the business of making people feel as if they belong, even though no one belonged with Jesus. Nobody could keep up with him, and yet he made sure that they knew that they belonged with him. And it's our job as God's people to do the same here on earth, here within these walls. And as we go out from this church, that people know that we want them to be with us, to belong with us. And we are also to have a love that is compassionate. See, there's a difference in consideration and compassion. Compassion is a love that goes out of our way. This is the idea that Jesus gave us in Luke, Luke chapter 10 with the Good Samaritan. In that parable, Jesus was explaining that there's this man that was robbed. He was, he was left to just die. And then you had several people to come by and, and act as if they didn't see. They would go to the other side so they would not come across this man who needed help. But then there was the good Samaritan who not only tried to help, but went out of his way. He went to the other side so that he would pass them. You see, compassionate love is a love that goes out of our way so that someone can know the love of Christ. That we would not wait for an opportunity, but rather we would look and we would seek out opportunity. You see, this is a true love. This is a love that is greater. This is the love that is explained to us here in Hebrews chapter 13, is that it is a love that is so compassionate that you see people the way God sees them, that you respond to them the way that God would respond to them, and that you would show them the love of Christ because this is what they ultimately need. Our job is to go out of our way, and he says, even if they cannot repay you. You know, the Puritan John Bunyan, he said this. He says, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. Do you, do you know that that's what he's talking about with those who are in prison? It's not just the ones who are in prison because of, uh, of gospel persecution. He's talking about everybody who is in prison. Yes, he is including those who were uh, in prison because of persecution, but it's everybody. It's those who cannot repay you. It's those who are incarcerated. It's those who are locked up. It's the down and out. It's the marginalized. It's the least of the world. 
And Jesus warns us, he says this in Matthew chapter 25. He says, truly I tell you, whatever you do for the least of these, guess what? You did of me, you did to me. So Jesus is not only our example of how to love, but he is the recipient of our love. He says, the way you treat these brothers and sisters who cannot repay you, who cannot do anything in return, he says, the people that need you most, that need the love of God most, he says, when you do that for them, you're doing it to me. And it's this reminder of why I'm so grateful for the prison ministry that we have here at Green Acres. You know that just this past year, I mean, six months, seven months, whatever it is, uh, that we have seen over 50 people give their life to Jesus in our prison ministry. We've seen over 50 baptisms in our prison ministry of those who are desperate. And listen, and it's so much of what you do. Listen, when the storms came through, guess what? Guess who responded? You did. You were out in the streets. You were out feeding people. You were out cutting up trees. You were out making sure that our neighbors didn't need anything. And, and if they did need something that we were providing, for them. Do you understand that every dollar you invest is so that strangers will know the name of Jesus and so that those who are in, in, in need of help will have help. This is the kind of church that you are. This is the kind of people that we are. We want to continue doing this. And I praise God for that because it's not normal. But don't you want to keep being abnormal? I mean, it's unbelievable. but we also have a love that is committed. I think that is interesting the way that Hebrews 13 comes about because you go from this incredible theological explanation and then you get to Hebrews chapter 13 where he gets uh, extremely practical in how we live and, and the ethic of our lives, but then he starts just picking things out it looks like. He's like, oh, hey, make sure you take care of your brothers and sisters inside the church. Hey, also make sure you love strangers. Hey, make sure you love those who are in need. Make sure you love those who are marginalized down and out. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, and by the way, uh, make sure you're loving your spouse. It just seems random. But none of it is random because what the writer is doing is he is giving us an explanation of how we must live the best we can in order to show the depth of Christ's love for the world. And so he's using these examples that are going to give the clearest picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would we love people who can't do anything in return for us? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Why do we love our brothers and sisters? Because Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. Why do we love those who are down and out? Because we were down and out. We were in the pit. And Jesus reached down and, and pulled us out. Everything is about Christ. And then he says, but also love your spouse. Why? He says uh, right here in verse 4, he says, marriage is to be honored by all. By all. Do you know what? It means in the Greek, all. Go ahead and say it. All, thank you. See, you're all scholars. <laughs> the idea here is he's not talking to married people. He's not talking to single people. He's talking to everyone. If you are young, if you are old, if you are married, if you are single, marriage is to be honored by all. Why? Because it takes all of us to uphold marriage as a society, as a church, it takes all of us to uphold and honor marriage. And why should we be so protective about marriage? Because marriage is the gospel in the flesh. And so if you are married, the way you love your spouse is giving a clear example to the world of the way that Jesus loves the church or the church responds to Jesus. If you are single, this informs the way you date. If you are looking forward to marriage, this informs the way that you live your life right now. It should change the way you date. It should change the way you look at a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's not about who is the best looking. It's not who, who will actually just say yes to you to go on a date. It's about who has God laid aside for me so that we can live out God's mission together. Therefore, I'm not looking for a spouse. I'm looking for a mission partner. I'm not looking for a boyfriend. I'm looking for somebody who's going to make me more like Christ, who's 
going to pray for me, who's going to love me the way that Christ loves the church. This is the idea that we would lay down our lives in this way so that the world would look at marriage, the world would look at the way you date, the world would look at the way you choose a boyfriend or a girlfriend and know this person is different. They have something different and it's the love of Christ that is in you that makes you different. And this is, informs everything about the way we live our lives, the way we serve, the way that we give sacrificially. It informs everything. It is the love of Christ that is in us that should flow from us so that those who do not know Jesus Christ will know Jesus Christ because of the way you are loving them. Amen. See, it, it changes everything. We must have a love that is committed in this way. And he brings us a final word and says that you must have a love that is content. And I'm just going to be honest. I think of all of these points that the writer brings out, I think this is the most difficult. Contentment is one of the clearest markers of your understanding of who Christ is in your life. It's kind of a scary thing to think about because if you are living a life that is always desiring more, what it means is that you are incomplete. And the only completion that you and I could ever have is from Christ himself. You see, the depth of your contentment is dependent on God's love in you and for you. So when we understand all that we have in Christ, it draws us into a place of contentment. And contentment has everything to do with material things of the world. This is why he says, keep your life free from the love of money. Instead, be satisfied. Be satisfied. You see, those who love money will never be able to love their neighbor well. When you love money, you can't love people in the church well. When you love money, you can't love your spouse. When you love money, you can't love your family. When you love money, ultimately you cannot love Christ. Jesus warns us. He says, you cannot serve two masters. You can't love money and love me. This is not how it works. You either love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. This is the only way that it works. And so the warning here is that you would not love money, but rather you would be content in all that Christ has given you. And this is way easier said than done. I promise. You know that. I know that. The fact that we live in the land of the free and we live in the land of capitalism means that your, your money and your wealth is up to your determination. You can make more money. You can lose money. You can gamble money. You can do whatever you want with money. This is the land of the free. But what Jesus says is do not love money because if you love money, you will sacrifice your neighbor. If you love money, you will sacrifice your family. If you love money, you will sacrifice the down and out. But if you love Jesus, you will sacrifice money to take care of all these other things if we truly know the love of Christ. And the warning for us is that we would live out the love that has been given to us. You know, when I was praying through this and I was just thinking through just the depth of God's love and I'm just reminded, I, I don't know if any of you have ever been through just one of those difficult times where you've had a loved one that was sick maybe a spouse that was sick, maybe a child that was sick. And in those moments, you would do anything to, change, to trade places with them. I mean, I think about that with my own kids or my own wife, that when they're sick, I will, I will do anything to trade places with them. Like I, I pray, God, just give me their sickness. Let, let me have it, and I'll, I'll take it. I promise, I will take it. Just make them better. Just help them to be better. I, I know that many of you have been there. And I was just thinking about that because it reminds us in those moments of just how helpless and hopeless we are. I, I mean, I would do anything to trade places. I just don't have the power to do it. And yet... Jesus was that. God sent his one and only son, watched him 
be flogged, watched him be whipped, watched him hang on a cross, watched him take his last breath. And the thing is that God could have done something. God had the power to do something. And yet because he loved you so much, he chose not to do anything so that you could have life. You see, this is the depth of God's love that must flow from us. In fact, John three sixteen says this. He says, for God loved the world in this way that he, would, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting eternal life. He said, I'm going to give my own son even though I could create a different way. I just want you to know how much I love you. And when we have this love, we can love each other well. When we have this love, we can love the stranger. We can be compassionate and we can be committed to one another and we can be content in all things knowing that because I have Christ, I'm in no need of anything else in my life. The question is, do you truly have this love? Like, have you ever truly surrendered to this love? Because love is the test for us to know whether or not we have the love of Christ in us. Is that love flowing from you? Are you loving others well? Do you go out of your way to love people? I just want us to contemplate that just as a church. Would you just bow your head and just close your eyes just for a moment and just think through, God, are we loving people well? Do we have your love Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that you showed us this love, you provided this love, you gave this love through your son on a cross. God, thank you that this was the greatest demonstration of love that the world could ever know is what you did for us on the cross. That you would take our sins upon yourself that you would get rid of our sins, that we could be forgiven of our sins because of what you did on the cross. Father, there's no greater love than that. And Lord, we ask you to make it clear right now if we have that love or not. And then Father, for those of us that we, we know you, we're walking with you, we're, we're attempting to to die to ourselves day after day. Father, would you help us to love each other well? Will you help us to love the stranger? Will you help us to love them so that they feel as if they belong to you and to this church? God, help us to continue in brotherly love for one another. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.